Well, it's been a heck of an investigative year. Well, it's a brand new year. So, well, I bet you there'll be a heck of a new year in investigations, too. What a start to the show. <laughs> oh, we start the year off kind of punchy. Happy New Year to you. This is airing on Friday, the 2nd of January. Now, I will tell you that we produced this program a couple of weeks back as we got ready for the holidays because the chubby guy in the television needed a little time off. But this is, uh, this is no throwaway show. It's always great when I get to talk with Tim White, and uh, he needs no introduction. But he certainly blew the doors off of a couple of stories here in 2014. So what we're going to do tonight, without a rundown, because um, I'm not here for the daily discussion of the news today, but I will tell you that uh, there was a lot of daily news that we talked about over the course of the year this past year with Tim's work. For instance, stuff like, you know, this one when the speaker's office was raided. And then there's others, you know, you've got, uh, you've got investigations in the 38 studios and then you've got a fire chief who kind of gets a little jammed up. Well, first of all, you got the ongoing story of the, of the weightlifting firefighter. Then you got the, but geez, Louise, he's got a lot of, a lot of stuff going on. Tim White is in studio. How are you? Good, Dan. How are you? Happy New Year. It's a little early to tell if it's a Happy New Year, right? Yes. <laughs> happy well, New Year to you as well. The, uh, was this a heavy year for you it this was. past year? Yeah, it was. And I, I hope my boss is watching. It was a very, very busy year <laughs> uh, because we had, we had a lot of investigations. You outlined some of them there. And then we had some investigations where the ripple effects have continued. I mean, the, the weightlifting story, we yeah. heard that in 2011. Right. And that is still, we're, what, three years later going through the courts. And then it was an election year. Right. So 14 was uh, very busy all around. So before we get into the stories themselves, the ones that, uh, that Target 12 uh, has been working and continues to work, talk to me about the nature of the investigative reporting that you've been doing your career. This is high charge stuff mm -hmm. and it takes discipline and patience, doesn't it? Because when you're out there knowing you're following somebody for weeks or months at a time, you got to go to bed at night thinking, I want to get this on the air, but you got to get it right. And you really work hard on getting it right. And for all the ones that you see on the air where we're uh, you know, following people around, if it I, I realize the undercover investigations we do tend to be the ones that get the most attention, but those are, are actually in the minority as far as the type of work that we, we put on television. But for all of those big ones that you see, there are a lot that just are on the cutting room floor that never make it because there's a, a, a threshold, there's a bar that we have to pass that we're comfortable with editorially for it to, to make TV. So you're, you're working on the ones you see and then you're working on the ones that you don't see. So there has to be a whale of a time commitment and a resource commitment from where I work to, to make that happen. And, and uh, so far, luckily, that, that's been the case. Well, it hasn't been the case in the television industry in general, no. to be honest with you. And I think that's changing, though. I think, I think what you're seeing is uh, investigative journalism um, Look, it's a business. I mean, I, I don't work for NPR, um, so the, 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 uh, these models work on an advertising model and they t to make money. And I think there's been a recognition that um, th this type of work, investigative journalism, uh, original content, can make money. Now, I don't work on commission, so I don't get a cut, in it, nor should it ever be that way. But I think you see my point. If it, It's got to work in a business model. Uh, for that to happen and so this is something I've been here for more than eight years now at Channel 12 um, and it's something they've grown the investigative unit throughout the eight years that I've been here now I'm starting to see that nationally and I do think we were we were ahead on that uh, I'm comfortable saying that I worked in Boston for 10 years um, so I feel like I have a, a and I read all the trades and things like that now for local news to to be relevant and um, to produce quality stuff, they see a value in investigative reporting. Hmm. Well, I think the audience sees the value. I hope so. Well, I hope so. I, I, believe me, if the audience wasn't seeing a value, then true, there would be no value. That's right. Although that's really kind of a hard conversation to have because uh, you wonder sometimes what audience expectations are versus what you deliver to them 
and then they expect it later. In other words, you know, I think you kind of set a bar when it comes to investigative work in this television market, and uh, others I think have tried to follow. You know, Jim Hummel is now, you know, working hard online, mm -hmm. um, has lesser restrictions online in terms of time, and maybe other issues in putting stuff up, but uh, you've had to craft a major league niche here, which now has become a major league franchise in the news, and I would imagine when you come knocking on doors now, it's a little bit, oh, <laughs> what does he want? What does he want? I know he's a nice guy, but what does he want? Right? <laughs> Sometimes you got to have yeah. some funny stories about uh, you knocking on doors and making phone calls for people. Oh, my God, no. Uh, yeah, I get, I get a few oh no's for sure when that happens. And, you know, when you point out Jim Hummel and, and others who have done work, I like to think that it's sort of that rising tide lifts all boats hmm. philosophy, you know, that if we're doing a good work here or if he's doing good work over there, uh, that confidence is being built by viewers and by readers, that, that, that this stuff happens in this market. And they'll they'll tune in more. It is kind of an interesting. Hopefully to us. It is an interesting <laughs> thing, though, that journalists are affecting not only quality of life, but stories that have a criminal flavor to them. It's that it, that's the point, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, to make change, to affect change, is is the it, with investigative reporting. I mean, that's the, the law idea. enforcement community is is not the beginning and the end of the resource in order to find out what's going on that's wrong right. out there. And I think that's I agree with that. That's sort of the fourth estate uh, right. mentality to to all of this. And um, our goal is to look and and when you bring up law enforcement, um, there are in many ways the media can be the organization that polices the police. In, in some ways, we had a story in Fall River about a guy that was arrested, you might remember this, guy named George Thompson, he was arrested for uh, videotaping a, uh, a police officer. Now, uh, the guy, the police officer didn't like it, he got angry right. and arrested him under the state's wiretapping statute. It was absurd, it was absolutely absurd. So we filed story after story on that and finally the charges were dropped. Um, that is obviously an egregious case and by no means is law enforcement like that all around, but you get to highlight those cases. Yeah. All right, when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the specific cases that Target 12 has offered you this year and see where they're going, because they're not all done. Mm -hmm. Stay with us. Welcome back. Tim White is my guest on the program and honored to have him. We have uh, all sorts of Target 12 stuff that we can catch up on this year and you know it began with the raids well listen there's a lot of Target 12 stuff going on prior to this but the, the story that is now like dormant is Gordon it feels Fox. that way feels right? that way yeah I mean, you I have agree. done such great work I mean again there's the WPRI.com headline and by the way the reason why we're not playing segments of, of Tim's work is that again there's a lot of legal analysis and protection that goes along with the the, the stuff that tim produces unless all I my stories go through the legal meat grinder i'll, I'll say it on your behalf and unless i can air it from beginning to end you don't air segments of investigative pieces because it all has to be in context, in context yes um but we can talk about them sure uh gordon fox is hanging out there what march right yeah march the raids happened Speaker of the House. Speaker of the House, and it led to uh, to a seismic shift in the power structure in Rhode Island. I mean, no arrests now going on months, and yet we have a new Speaker of the House. I can't even call him new anymore. But going into that legislative session, that changed everything as far as what kind of policy they were going to, what laws are going to get passed. I mean, people need to understand how significant it was that Gordon Fox stepped down in the wake of those raids. So what's happening? We, we've reported that um, the investigation is not about 38 studios, or as of yet, anyway. You never know where it's going to lead. Uh, it's not about anything else but about campaign finance uh, and expenditures by, by the uh, former House Speaker. And we, and we should note, he, he hasn't been charged. Uh, he hasn't even been publicly identified as a target by any law enforcement agency. Um, but we know from the people I've talked to, uh, investigators, and then through records that they've subpoenaed uh, the area that, that they're looking at. And this investigation, I'm told, is still very active. It's a mountain of evidence that they're going through. And I, I 
you said this is airing on January 2nd. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if we heard something very soon. Well, uh, the idea that politicians and elected officials, which are the same thing sometimes, tap into their campaign funds for things that they really shouldn't be tapping into them for is a rampant dynamic and something I've watched and covered and opined about for a long period of time. I think that there's all sorts of things systemically that ought to be changed. The idea that somebody makes a contribution at a spaghetti supper for $25 because they believe in Tim White who's running for whatever office or Dan York who's running for whatever office and then I turn around and take money and I send it to another politician just to support the old boy network I think is disingenuous but very legal but there are sure. other things that happen and we've seen the history and the culture of big dinners downtown with 15 or 20 reps all on the campaign dime that's when we start to stretch the legitimate use and that's legal but then we start to then then but once you've got access to hundreds of thousands of dollars which is the case of Gordon Fox because of the position he was in correct. not not all state reps or state senators right most of them run around with 10 or 20 grand max right but right. because of who he is he's got a boatload of dough sitting there for restaurants travel trips all of which have to be legitimized in his official duty where we're going to find out perhaps that that's not the case. Yeah, we'll find we'll find out what what they're looking at in campaign finance. One other interesting thing that I found in Rhode Island, and I, I'll be honest, we talk about context. I don't know how it is in other states here, and I, I should look at it. You can co-mingle your campaign and your personal account uh, in Rhode Island, and that insane. It, it's not the case anywhere else well, it, uh, around here in the neighborhood. I know it's not the case in Massachusetts. Right. Okay. So in so in New England, it's unique. Yeah. To your knowledge, I it, think so. I think it is. It, but the re reaction. Your reaction was a very real one. Common sense would be you should not commingle those. And I think that's something that is going to be looked at or should be looked at going down the road. Not to say that's going to be the case uh, if Gordon Fox gets charged here, uh, yeah. but it's still one of the bizarre things I found. So we moved to 38 Studios, and uh, we've got another WPRI.com headline that we, can, that we can run here. When you say that Gordon Fox is not being looked at for 38 Studios, I say, oh, yeah, why not? And so we'll see what goes on here. But you were the first to, you know, to talk to Michael Corso, the lobbyist. Uh, you That's chased him, him on down. The right there, there is. Yeah. Uh, he is a guy who's a longtime friend of Gordon Fox. I mean, they've had a business relationship. He held fundraisers for All Gordon that. Fox. And, you know, he's the one who's kind of like the deal maker on Kurt Schilling the governor, putting them all together, blah, blah, blah. But the lethargy of 38 Studios, just look at the radio lines. If I, if I bring it up now, unless there's something brand spanking new, people kind of go, I don't want to hear about Sick it anymore. It, huh? We've really kind of elasticized this conversation. We are, there's so much more yet to report in this case, and everyone's exhausted by it. Interesting. Yeah, and they're uh, prepared to get even more exhausted by it. I mean, it was in our debate in June where uh, two of the three Democratic gubernatorial candidates uh, pledged that they would throw an independent investigation into 38 studios if they were elected, and guess what? One of them was Gina Raimondo, mm. um, and she said that she is still committed to that. In the case of Michael Corso, you know, here is a... Uh, and all she's got to do is hear from Steve O'Donnell from the state police when he says, boy, I'm uncomfortable with that, and she'll back off, and that campaign promise is done. You might be right, and good uh, state police say, um, I just had Colonel O'Donnell on Newsmakers, and he said they still have an active investigation into 38 Studios. So while you and I talk about how there is uh, there's no federal investigation, there is a state investigation going on. I'll be interested to see where that where that goes. Uh, the, the feds were in there and out quick. They looked at that, saw there were no banking or investment violations, and, and that was what they felt by statute they could, they could look at. Um, Michael Corso uh, now is uh, could be fined two thousand dollars if he doesn't retroactively register as a lobbyist. Um, you know, I, I think this is in the wake of a report that we did showed that he had a contract, $300,000 to interact with government officials, and as you pointed out, he was in all these high-level meetings. Um, but he can only be fined $2,000, and I, as soon as we aired that story, there was a lot of frustration from people. $2,000, you know, I'm going to guess that the legal fees paid by the state to even get the lobby hearings forward um, mm -hmm. 
going to outweigh that two thousand dollars. Duh, price. I would think so. Yeah, but it's it's like it's like the kindergarten um, JV of what really ought to be done in this particular case. The auspice of the Secretary of State fining Michael Corso two thousand dollars for not identifying his lobbying is is laughable in terms of the width and breadth of where this thing ought to go. In my humble judgment, so we'll see what the state police come up with, and we'll see if the Gordon Fox investigation ends up mingling with this particular case, because let's not forget, Gordon Fox is one of the only two legislators who knew about that stealth blind vote, the famous night that the House of Representatives voted for the loan guarantee program that authorized the money to go to 38 Studios. Uh, I don't see that as a political shenanigan. I see that as a criminal exercise. Instinctively, I know that's a criminal exercise. I just hope the state police find a way to well, if take that were the, the underpinning of that. If that were the criminal exercise, why wouldn't the feds I mean, the feds have handled public corruption, Operation Dollar Bill. No, They've no. been in there. You, you answer that question for me. I don't know why, why the feds don't have any interest in this. I don't know why the feds don't have an interest in seeing that 75 legislators took a vote on something uh, not knowing what the end game was. While, while, they, while there are people... So that would be under your, the, as a fact that 75 legislators didn't know. Well, let's put it this way. 73 legislators will tell you they didn't know. Yes, I know. I'm, I feel right. like I've asked all of them. <laughs> right? They'll tell you they didn't yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, it's it's just it's just one of the most uh, uh, interesting and I think it's a complete political and, and criminal anomaly. But hopefully in 2015 the whole thing kind of evens out and we learn some things about it. And if there's stuff to be learned, I'm sure Tim will be all over it. And then of course, if you're in Coventry, uh, you either love them or you hate them. Uh, I know how the chief feels. We'll talk about that when we come back. Stay with me. Sometimes these Target 12 stories, though, are just funny. I mean, they're not funny, but they're funny. And you watch the story on the chief in the Coventry Fire District, and, and I, don't, I don't know what he was thinking sitting down with you. And the classic part of that conversation was when he got up to leave, you more or less said, no, no. Sit, sit down. Yeah. I'm and not done with you yet. And he did. I know. My, <laughs> ki my kids don't listen to me on that. But. <laughs> it was a different. That was even surprising to me in the moment. But it was. I'll just tell you on that, since a lot of people talk about it. Uh, split decision to to ask him or you know to tell him to stay, because we had more video we needed to show him, and mm -hmm. we were building up to something. I was afraid he was going to take the mic off and leave, and that was it. Go in the office, shut the door, and uh, game would be over. Sure, it'd be a fine dramatic moment on television, but that's not what we were there for. Right. We were there for answers. Well, this guy, you you, you surveilled him for. How long a period of time? Months. I mean, we started in March, and then, you know, you, you go back periodically, and then we really started picking back up, uh, again, I would say, in May and June, hmm. all the way through to October, Columbus Day. Right, and you got him, you got him at some events, uh, drinking some beers while he's driving, the, a lot of beers, I guess, mm -hmm. a lot of beers. And then the classic is you've got him with uh, a, uh, a cigar. Sharing with, a cigar sharing with a, a group, cigar of with a group of, which is which is I think and for all earlier and purposes. In that story. most people can see that that's a little bit of reefer. So we can't we can't uh, we can't stop giggling at those kind of stories. But at the end of the day, they're not funny. Um, you had a tough question to answer from some when you were trailing him in a vehicle mm -hmm. after he had been. How could he not be intoxicated? Mm -hmm. And you didn't call the cops. You called. I mean, you just ran your story. But you're not the police. You don't have a responsibility to... No, but I, I would say... That was a tough one, right? It was a tough one. Uh, it, we should have. We lost him. Um, I'll just not to get too in the weeds. He took 90... We thought he would take 95 South back to Coventry. He didn't. And so we had nowhere to there tell him know. to go. Where's that story going to end up? Well, there's an independent investigation. Uh, they've hired Bill Harsh. I don't know if you remember. He ran yes. for AG. Yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, they're examining our investigation, see where else it can take it. I think the board is moving very carefully. People were upset when he was suspended with pay, the fire chief. Um, but they're doing that so they don't do double jeopardy. And sometimes these stories just go on and on. What about the firefighter? This guy is still, you know, appealing or he just lost another appeal and, and he won't do the medical examination that's required for him to, to be able to prove his story. Right? He is suing the city for seven million dollars I believe but he he lost a, a preliminary injunction to get his pension back while that lawsuit was moving forward and and you're right I, I think the argument that the city made in court was like this this would all be over he just needs to go to the doctors uh, that of their choosing in Massachusetts and he is refused here's the funny part about what Tim does 
I can congratulate him for great journalistic work in 2014, and I shall. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. But I can't ask you what's coming up in 2015. <laughs> That's right. Because you can't tell me what you're doing. I can't. But I think I'll be busy with Gordon Fox. Yeah. I think we all will. And then we have some big, we have big trials going on, Hernandez and Sarnayev and all that. All that stuff. Yeah. And it's not an election year. Oh. <laughs> I'm so happy it's not it's an election not. year. I'm not. I kind of like that stuff. Anyway. Uh, yeah. In the rearview mirror, I like it. Happy New Year, man. Thanks. Happy New Year to you. Thank all you. Right. One more thing. Welcome back. One more thing. Politics. We didn't get a chance on yeah. Newsmakers, which is a staple watch for me. And, of course, fodder we, for your show on the radio. Without a doubt. <laughs> Thank God for that. Um, what do you think the, the, the governmental climate will be after this election in 2015? Do you think Gina Raimondo is going to get some traction on her jobs, jobs, jobs? I thing? think she's going to have a honeymoon uh, period, Gina Raimondo. Uh, you know, I, she look, she didn't get 50% of the vote, right? Right. Um, so she's got a lot of work to do there. But I do. I think there'll be a honeymoon period. And the question is, how is she going to work with the General Assembly? That, to me, is going to be where to watch Gina Raimondo's leadership. Yeah, well, I think she's got one eye on Washington as she has one foot in the door at the State House. What, what piece in Washington is she looking at? Who knows? But uh, she's got to stop flapping her gums to people about how she's got an interest in being the Vice President. That would be a good place to stop and focus on what the heck she's doing here. But... Uh, but we'll see. Were you surprised by anything in the election? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess with Buddy, if he had won or lost, either mm. way, it would have been a surprise. Yeah. That, that sucked the oxygen out of the room. It would have been a surprise if he won or if he lost. I wasn't surprised. I'm surprised how much Healy off. got. Mm. That was a lot. I mean, was it 20% of so the yeah. memory serves? I mean, well, that was high. I knew he'd be in the double digits, but I thought that was pretty high. All right. So we'll have to watch newsmakers all year as well yes, to make sure that absolutely. you've got the insight. I think between the two of us, we've got it covered. Okay, that? yeah. Sounds right. good. We'll see you later. <laughs>